Welcome everyone who is joining the faculty artist panel this afternoon. We're going to wait for people to stream in from the waiting room. Um, just hang on a few seconds and we will get underway. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. We will be recording this session. Uh, we will have um, closed captioning provided by ACS. Um, and we are recording so that we can post this afterward to the University Gallery's YouTube account. The chat is open, so if you have questions for any of our panelists, you can post those in the chat. You can also feel free to ask them out loud. Um, it's up to you, whatever you're more comfortable with. But know that we will be monitoring the chat um, and we'll get to your questions at the end. A bit of a roadmap for today's session. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to introduce each panelist. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes about their work in the show this year. And then we are going to take questions at the end. Um, so I think we will get underway. I am going to have Jonte share his screen. Fabulous. All right. Welcome everyone to the faculty panel discussion. Um, oh, Adam is sending me a note. Okay, quick correction. Um, the audience can submit questions through the chat. You won't be able to ask. Um, so just feel free to post the questions in the chat. So welcome to today's a panel discussion. I'm Casey Mathern. I'm the Interim Gallery Director here at the University Galleries. Um, John Tay Silver is also joining us. He is the Gallery Coordinator for the University Galleries. We're very lucky to have him with us. And uh, Taylor Cassisi is not here, but he is our graduate assistant, also helping us out this semester. So this program is to support our fall exhibition uh, which is a faculty exhibition. And this year, 16 faculty members submitted their work and were chosen to be part of um, the exhibition. And the work ranges from uh, two-dimensional work, three-dimensional work, a record number of videos this year, which I think owes to the pandemic. And we are lucky to have three of those artists and faculty members with us. So today we are going to be hearing from Gianluca Bianchino, Ashley Gerst, and Eileen Foti. They are all instructors here at William Patterson University, and they are all practicing artists. I'm going to introduce each of them, and they will each speak for about 10 minutes about their work in the show this year. And we'll be showing slides of those works as they speak. And after all of the presentations are wrapped up, we will open the floor and we will be posing your questions for them. So please post your questions in the chat. Enjoy, let us know if you have any questions and we're gonna try to stay on schedule so that we're out of here by one. Looks like there's a question. Um, I believe that you can um, if you have headphones, you can route the audio that way so that you're not disturbing anyone around you. Um, 
and you can you can certainly mute yourself if you're not already. All right, so we're going to get started. <clears throat> First up, Gianluca Bianchino is a multimedia artist and curator living and working in Northern New Jersey. Inspired by physics and architecture, his work is focused on immersive installations and interactive sculptures that often engage with optics and technology. Whether working in 2D or 3D, Bianchino tends to consistently express lyrical qualities that stem from a background in painting and an interest in astronomy. Originally from Italy, he attended an architectural magnet school before relocating to the U.S., where he received a BFA in painting from New Jersey City University and an MFA from Montclair State University focused on sculpture and installation. Bianchino is currently an adjunct professor of art at Montclair State University, William Patterson University, and at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. He exhibits regularly throughout the greater New York area, as well as internationally. Recent exhibits include Suzhou Art Center in Suzhou, China, Governor's Island Art Fair, The Painting Center, Chashama, Rooster Gallery, The Islip Museum in Islip, New York, The Hunterdon Museum in Clinton, New Jersey, and solo exhibits in Jersey City University and Index Art Center in Newark. He has been a resident artist at Ramapo College, the Center for New Art at William Patterson University, the Eileen S. Kaminsky Family Foundation at Mana Contemporary, Gallery of Pharaoh, and Gilbertsville Expressive Movement. Bianchino's work has been written about in Art Fuse, Sculpture Magazine, Nautilus Magazine, the New Jersey Star Ledger, and the New York Times. His work can be viewed at GianlucaBianchino.com. Please welcome Gianluca Bianchino. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify, we're not necessarily doing a screen share showing a body of work, or are we? Um, right now, Jante is sharing a slideshow. Okay, with yeah. In the <clears throat> so the, yeah. So um, the work that is up at um, the Ben Sean Gallery is uh, a conflation of photography and uh, three-dimensional elements combined. Um, it is a current body of work uh, developed uh, during the pandemic. Um, but not necessarily specifically pandemic related. Uh, it just happened to be a good time to um, investigate an aspect of my work that uh, I had been considering for a while. Um, so I had more time uh, since I was basically broadcasting my classes from my studio. Um, so in that sense, the Oddly enough, the pandemic was actually a good time to uh, explore some some new ideas. Um, so, Ada's Foe is uh, a series that uh, actually stems from uh, my installation work, and the installation work is uh, multimedia, generally large scale. Uh, tends to include um, video projection. Uh, conflating with uh, found objects, um, among other things. And the found objects are generally uh, part of a lexicon that bridges both my interest in sort of space, uh, both the astronomical space and the lyrical space within art, you know, like 2D, 3D, um, trump -Lale. Um, and so those objects generally, so they're conf conflating this interest in space with uh, sort of semi-autobiographical um, elements. Um, the objects tend to be generally tripods, uh, photo umbrellas, um, 
projectors. The projectors are embedded within the installation, so they're they're visible. They're integral to the structure. Uh, sometimes um, uh, objects that are related even to painting. So they tend to be autobiographical in the sense that uh, they come from um, uh, a background in photography. As I worked as a commercial photographer for many years, primarily photographing weddings and corporate events. Um, there's also lights, like a lot of clamp lights, um, which are the typical, and light stands, which are typical of an artist's studio. So metaphorically, they somehow represent this uh, sort of interest in exploration. So the, the art space is the kind of astronomical world in which um, I immerse myself. And as a result, you need these tools. So over time, they've uh, evolved into, into these multimedia installations. Um, and the installations um, don't sort of end there. In themselves, they are presented at openings as, you know, works onto their own, uh, in their own right. But then later, I usually try to negotiate with the gallery or the institution housing the installation. If I can go back in and just photograph or take videos of the installation itself. So it becomes in a way a kind of prop scene for creating abstract photography and uh, ab and video art. Um, so it's almost like coming from, in, in a way, I, I, you know, I kind of don't want to let go. Um, there's this feeling of, you know, the interior, the, the installation goes up and then it gets taken down and that's it. So in my case, um, I've sort of evolved to be an artist who makes a lot of self-generative work. Um, so the photo background, quote unquote, for these works come from the installation. So it's a previous installation I did at New Jersey City University. Um, and I had these printed and mounted on wood so that uh, I could actually cut the photograph uh, as if I'm cutting a kind of uh, plywood panel of sorts or masonite panel. So I generally order several copies perhaps of the same photo um, so that I can break some of them down. And, um, and then I start working with elements that are in themselves on smaller scale, but they're reminiscent of the way I work in, in the large installations. So there's hardware that's used to ground these kind of wires or cables, uh, which work as sort of linear cues across the surface. So I start building the surface into this somewhat low to mid relief. Um, a lot of the parts that you see that are integral to the relief, uh, wood for the most part, are actually um, cutouts from uh, other projects uh, where I laser cut um, and, and build surfaces for light boxes. So there's a lot of parts that sort of get discarded, but I'm interested in them. They're like triangles or lines or trapezoids uh, or shapes within shapes. And I'm always like reluctant to throw them out. So that what happened over time is I think I've started creating my own sort of economy of work within this narrative of self-generative work. So from drawing to installation and sculpture, back to photography, um, back to other objects that are also constructed, fabricated, a combination of wood shop techniques and sometimes laser assist. Um, so in this work, there's a there was like a kind of free range. It was sort of like a free range in a way um, uh, field to 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 work, play, build on imagery, reintroduce elements of painting. Um, so the idea of conflating photography with painting. So they're painted shapes. Um, the blue that is um, visible in some of the images is actually coming from uh, a current body of work that's in a similar vein uh, where I'm using pigment. Um, so that blue is like a pure pigment that I'm borrowing from a different, um, from a related body of work. Um, 
And really, this was an experiment. I've made about four to six of these and then went back to other projects. And uh, I think I wanted some time to see how audiences would, re would respond. Uh, it was the pandemic, so there, I think this is maybe the first or second opportunity where I've been able to show this work publicly. So the response has been interesting and um, you know, I'm plotting new ones, which means I have a current installation up at Bergen Community College. There's a closing on Friday. Uh, there's a performative aspect to it. And then right before I take it down, I'll have a day to myself in the gallery taking further high resolution photographs from which I will then order some of these printed canvases. Um, and then I'll continue exploring. These are small scale. Uh, so I foresee myself potentially going into a larger scale uh, maybe even combining multiple surfaces together. So that's where it is. And so Aedis uh, in Greek means geometry. So when it comes to this idea of the universe or astronomy, over time, I've become much more interested in the things we don't see. So less of, say, the Hubble Space Telescope type of images and more like the behavior of space, the multiple dimensions, you know, the, which are, you know, as much as you can listen to document, watch documentaries, read books that are crafted for a lay audience, uh, it sort of makes sense, but it's still sort of mysterious. You know, it's almost like somebody can explain to you how electricity works, but it's still really magical in a way, right? Um, so, uh, so it's my way to rationalize a kind of larger problem that sometimes even physicists have a hard time wrapping their hands their heads around it. And maybe that's the beauty of art is that we can, we have our own way of uh, rationalizing these larger ideas and from that creating um, a visual, it could be a visual interpretation or just simply it's it, in a way its own language. So yeah, I think, I don't know if that was 10 minutes, but... <laughs> Um, I think we're right about there. I think that's okay. perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John Lico. All right. Next up, by alphabetical order, we have Eileen Foti. Eileen Foti has been teaching at William Patterson University since 2014. Previously, she was an assistant professor at Montclair State University, master printer at the Brodsky Center for Innovative Editions at Rutgers University, and the Interim Education Director at Tamarind Institute. Her work is included in the collections of the University Sains, Malaysia, Museum of Fine Art in Split, Croatia, the Musam Asala, Morocco, the Yin Chu An Art Museum in China, and museums and corporate collections throughout the United States. She has received fellowships from the New Jersey State Council for the Arts, the New Jersey State Council for the Humanities, Karma Foundation, and the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. She has had artist residencies throughout the world. Foti wrote and co-produced A Ripple in the Water, Healing Through Art, an award-winning documentary about activist Kim Berman's papermaking and embroidery projects used for poverty alleviation and HIV AIDS awareness programs for women in rural and urban communities across South Africa. It has been screened extensively at international film festivals and has aired nationally on PBS stations across the United States and in Canada. Let's welcome Eileen Foti. Thank you, Casey. Um, I would say that my work is sort of personal and universal at the same time. Um, I, I sort of can't help but react to what's going on around me, whether it's in my own backyard or across the world. And so a lot of times my work may have a subtle narrative quality to it, but it also may be references that are a tiny bit obscure. And if you sort of put the pieces together, you can tell a story. Um, 
this piece clearly focuses on the pandemic. And um, I have just a tiny little statement that was hanging next to the piece in the gallery. I'm just going to read it to you. It swept across the world in record time, burning everything in its path. It ravaged families, frontline workers, and life as we knew it. Some countries ran out of burial land, and others ran out of trees to create funeral pyres. But as with any momental, monumental fire, we go on by hoping that something meaningful will rise from the ashes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the materials. Normally, I'd much rather talk about the conceptual part of a piece, but in this case, the materials are part of the conceptual part of the piece. The paper that was used here um, is was made at Frontline Arts in New Jersey, and it is made from donated hospital scrubs and lab coats. And these materials were beaten in a Hollander beater to fall apart to make pulp. We added a little bit of recycled cotton and formed these sheets of paper. So not only do they visually have an interesting quality, but the materials themselves really talk about the struggle and the the strife of the of the conflict and and of the pandemic and how the frontline workers are basically just putting their own lives on the line and they're wearing these garments as they battle the port the pandemic so using them in the actual piece was really important to me um if you're not familiar with frontline arts it's a nonprofit organization in new jersey that uses art as a way of achieving positive social transformation. They um, have a, a, a very strong focus on working with veterans who shred their military uniforms and they deconstruct the uniforms and they reconstruct them into something positive, which is handmade paper to be able to then make images on. So um, they started something called the Scrubs Paper Project, which I am on the, on the, on the, 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 the committee to reach out to artists and be able to use this paper to make imagery. But I certainly used it in my own work because I think it's a really important statement. Um, as to how the piece is made, um, I know that since we're talking to students, sometimes it's interesting to talk about the technique. Um, I work primarily in mixed media. So all of my work usually encompasses drawing, painting, printmaking, handmade paper, and collage. And most of the collage is made from materials that I generate myself. They're not usually found in materials. Since this paper has a very fibrous content to it, if you look at it on the screen, you can see a lot of the fibers of the lab coats and the scrubs running through the paper. It has a little bit of a, of a rough textural surface. As you can see, my drawings are pretty sensitive. So I knew that if I drew directly on that paper, it would influence the way the drawings look. So instead I drew them on lithography plates and I hand printed the images onto silk tissue which is a type of Japanese paper that's almost translucent. It's very translucent and almost transparent, actually. And that way, the integrity of the drawings was able to stay the way I intended. Then I cut them out and I glued them down onto the handmade paper so that you could sort of see the paper through the background. Um, there's some collage here. The, the flames that are burning the chest are painted on silk tissue and the tips of the flames are gold leafed and they're layered one over the other on the rib cage. And on the other side, the um, vascular image, if you will, or the image that sort of talks about being able to breathe is um, sewn shut with metallic threads because that's exactly what happens when you have COVID. And I made these images after you know losing some friends and having family members that have, have contracted COVID and have become um, disabled as, as a result. But it really isn't just so much about me and who I know. It's just about how this has changed all of our lives in general. So the materials are really a metaphor for what the piece is about. And that's pretty much it. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Ashley Gerst. Ashley Gerst is a 3D, 2D, and stop-motion animator based in the Lower Hudson Valley, New York. Originally from Ohio, Gerst received her BFA in Digital Arts from the Cleveland Institute of Art in 2007. 
She went on to receive her MFA in computer art from the School of Visual Arts in 2011. Her artwork is defined by a question she asks herself at the start of every new project. How can I combine all of the things I love? Those things include knitting, embroidery, food, history and nostalgia, her family, magical realism, building tiny worlds, and tiny ornate things. Her narratives are predominantly autobiographical and her films combine stop motion style sets, 2D animated effects, and 3D characters. She loves breathing life into imaginary characters by giving them hopes, dreams, and personalities. Unlike film, these characters are brought to life by their animator. She has shown her films, The Spirit Seam and The Cupcake Prince internationally at film festivals, and was recently awarded Best Animation Awards at the 2020 Wake Forest Film Festival and the 2019 Art Forum Festival of the Moving Image. Welcome, Ashley Gerst. I think you need to unmute yourself, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so this particular image that's on screen that's a part of the gallery uh, show this year is actually going to be a part of my next film, which is called Being Pushed Down by Shadow. Uh, it's a film of, it's a heartfelt horror movie, uh, all animated. This time though, the characters will be fully 2D animated, not 3D, but the rest of the formula for the majority of my films will remain the same. A lot of embroidered backgrounds, 3D printed environments, especially interiors. Um, typically I work with dollhouse scale, which is um, roughly one inch to one foot in terms of scale and size for a room. Um, and the characters in this case, again, will all be completely 2D animated. Most of the backgrounds will be embroidered, especially exterior scenes like this one. Um, this particular exterior scene uh, takes place, it, it, it's in the backyard of the main character's home. They live in a Rust Belt town. I keep it as generic as I can. Um, I want anybody in a traditional Rust Belt town, anywhere from like Pittsburgh to even um, not too far from here. It's not, it's not really a Rust Belt town, but even like Jersey City with like a lot of the looming factories, um, places like that. I want it to feel like any of those types of places, but this is a steel mill that is specific to the greater Cleveland area, which is my hometown. Uh, the film itself is about a college-aged undergraduate. Um, she's her age is not really defined, but she's between 18 and 20. Uh, and she lives with her single mom in a double house or an apartment. So she lives in the bottom unit and then there's an elderly woman that lives upstairs. Uh, the story follows the two, the mother and the daughters, they kind of don't get along. They don't really see eye to eye and they think very, very differently about the world. It takes place in 1970. Uh, so being a single mom, even during that time period, it was fairly unusual. And so the, she, her mother owns a dance studio in a strip mall. And uh, the main character, whose name is Paula, she is studying, I think it's going to be computer science. Um, she's going to be, I, I definitely want it to be, especially because she's a woman, I want it to be something that would be traditionally a male dominated field. Uh, so I think that she is going to be in um, computer science or possibly studying math um, and getting a degree in, in something math related. I haven't quite figured that out yet as the story is kind of still developing. The script is complete. I'm working on the storyboarding process. Uh, typically speaking, when it comes to creating an animation, you create a series of storyboards that showcase what's happening in each scene. Uh, what the camera angles are, what the characters are thinking and feeling, and then um, utilize that to help you build the animation. 
But this particular scene here is an establishing shot showing the audience that we are in a Rust Belt town. Uh, and this is actually what we're looking at here is the first completed animated scene that I've created for this film. So even though there are still pieces that need to kind of come together in terms of some of the small details, like maybe what her major is um, or what Paula's major is, um, maybe there's you know a couple other details like what some backgrounds might end up being and what uh, some rooms might end up looking like in the in the film, but um, it ends up being kind of an iterative process where you might do some storyboards one day, you might work on some 3D printing one day, you might make an embroidery one day, um, and eventually it all comes together at the end. The This film, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a heartfelt horror film, so eventually the, the mother and the daughter, uh, Paula, and they and her mother's name is Beverly eventually they begin to start seeing eye to eye because they're being haunted in their home by uh, un an unseen force that eventually ends up kind of materializing is this very very creepy um, ghost and skeletal figure of a woman who is kind of tormenting them and then they kind of come together to solve this problem the character is based on, um, and the, the term being pushed down by shadow, is a term for sleep paralysis. Um, there are so many different terms throughout many different, uh, many different countries and things like that. We call it sleep paralysis or sometimes old hag syndrome. And so that's the old hag is who is uh, kind of bothering them. And uh, it is, this, this woman that starts materializing eventually is no longer a part of their dreams or a part of their sleep paralysis and eventually becomes a part of their like waking life. And so that's what makes them kind of come together and solve this problem. The, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with what sleep paralysis is, it's typically a state between being awake and uh, being asleep where you are actually awake but you can't move your body and you also have a tendency to have some sort of like sleep-based hallucination so a really common one is feeling that there's a woman pushing on your chest or seeing a woman pushing on your chest sometimes there's audible ones where like someone might be saying your name or you might hear fluttering in your ears uh, another really common one and this is actually used in the first season of house on haunted hill that's on netflix um, there's a man with a cane with a hat, and that one's also commonly seen, like multiple countries, multiple people, um, and it affects one in four people kind of internationally, which I find very interesting. And most of my work is, um, as it was mentioned before, is autobiographical. So this story is about uh, mine and my mom, who was a single mom, uh, is a single mom still, but, um, you know, raised me as a single parent, uh, not always seeing eye to eye and then finding ways to do so. And then I actually also happened to have sleep paralysis. So when I was younger, I used to see ghosts a lot, things like that. And I, I kind of grew up and as I, I remember being in a class in undergrad one day and my professor talking about what sleep paralysis was and he's like who has that and like I have that um so I wanted to kind of bring all of these elements together into one uh cohesive story and then also add a lot of like my style um I love 2D animation I love embroidery and um different things like that and then one last thing I'll say um about this particular piece that's up um it's a mixture of medium so it is a digital drawing and then that digital drawing is printed onto fabric. And then I use the outline of that digital drawing to do the embroidery on it. Then the animation is done in a software called Toon Boom Harmony. It's fully 2D animated. And then composited or pulled together with the background elements uh, in a software called After Effects. So, it, which is a, a typically a, um, it can be used for motion graphics a lot of the time. So typically when you see a commercial where things are kind of like flying all over the place and text is moving and things like that has a tendency to have been most likely done in After Effects. It could be used for that and it can also be used for compositing 
or putting together multiple layers of an animation to make a cohesive finished uh, clip. And that's what, what this particular clip is. Fantastic. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, all three artists. And now we will open up the questions um, so that we can make this a discussion. Um, why don't we go back, Jante, to the first slide so we can see snippets of all three artworks. Um, I'll start out the questions. One question I have in seeing all of this material and hearing you speak about it today, um, each of you is working each of your works references materials, either through a photograph of a past installation or um, uh, uh, an embroidered surface that has become, you know, part of an animation, or hospital scrubs that have become part of a mixed media work. Um, my question for each of you is, and you can answer in whichever order you like. Um, my question for you is, were you always working in layers in this way, or is that something that came gradually through working with just one alone and then finding that adding several different media in became more, um, created a more layered effect? Is that something you had the goal to work with or something that happened by accident? I can start, um, you know, when I, starting from the time I was a child, I, I made art and always wanted to be an artist. And, you know, back then, most of it was always drawing and painting and drawing and painting and drawing and painting. But once I discovered um, printmaking in undergraduate school, and then, you know, then after that, the ability to make my own paper, um, it opened up a whole new world of being able to combine things together and have those materials really be sort of metaphors for the layering of the ideas as well. And I and I think that, it, at least for me, I, there's 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 not really a separation between the layering of the ideas and, and the layering of the mediums. And being able to use all different techniques en enables me to um, get a lot more mileage out of those materials. So by putting things together, it technically lets me do things that I couldn't do with just the singular techniques, but it also lets me layer the ideas and therefore the meaning of the work. So I feel like it, it was just a very natural evolution. To piggyback on that, I feel very much the same way. Um, honestly, through most of my childhood, it was all just drawing and painting, very much the same thing. And I didn't really do any sculptural stuff at all. Uh, and so I went to undergrad and I had to take a sculpture class. That was a requirement. And I it kind of like unlocked something. I'm like, wow, I really like this. Um, and I also had a friend that taught me how to knit when I was in undergrad. And so it kind of, I kept these things like separate, like sculpture, knitting, animation were all these three separate things. And then slowly I started combining them um, throughout um, undergrad. And it was something I, I began experimenting with and I really loved stop motion so it felt like a natural fit um but it was definitely something that it became a goal but it certainly wasn't one to start it just kind of started happening um yeah so <clears throat> when I was working primarily as a painter uh there was a, a kind of commitment or almost an obligation to the image uh like the image that I was referencing and then making a painting about an image um, in the in the long haul kind of started posing a problem um, regarding how I wanted to talk about space. So uh, there was a kind of anomaly experiment I did um, during my MFA where I you know began painting directly on a wall and then including elements of paper. The elements of paper uh, were three-dimensional so there was a relief element and I became really interested in how I actually lit the sculpture and it created shadows so first it was really about using three-dimensional um, uh, elements to create a field of light and shadow so that sort of 
became the material for a while, as well as a, a kind of symbolic stand-in for a, a complexity of space that maybe as a painter, because, you know, I was dedicated to painting the image was not coming through. You know, and it kind of just sort of took off from there and other materials were um, eventually became a part of the dialogue, you know, and so, yeah. Thank you, it's really interesting. I have another question. Um, as people think of their own and enter them into the chat, um, something I'm curious about, tell us about the spaces and materials that are part of your artistic practice. Where do you create and what tools or objects are always at your side? Oh boy. Um, is that for everyone or? It's for everyone. Oh, okay. Um, I think I've mentioned it already um, in my work. It's you know, uh, particularly with the installation, which tends to be a kind of focal point, even though installations are ephemeral, but they tend to lead me into other bodies of work that are more permanent. Uh, there's always the materials that are integral to uh, having a studio, like structurally speaking, you know, like having lights and light stands. And then somehow in all of this, I've realized that uh, cords, like electric cords, suddenly were a material that I could work with. Um, and I find myself really, you know, getting into complicated arrangements in my studio of how I want my lights to work, uh, or constantly moving my computer setup where it might work better in a different corner. And so then I'd have to rewire like 20 or 30 different cords again and speakers, and it's just a mess and a chaos of all sorts. And I end up having those problems. I have to solve those problems in my installations too. So I'm constantly, somehow electrical cords and lights are really the, the kind of go-to material uh, that are always up by my side, regardless of whether I'm making a sculpture or, or, uh, or even photography. answer the question uh, most of I tend to have two big workspaces uh, one of them is uh, right now my basement um, I recently moved I was in a, an apartment and I had two cats so when I would be working on all these like little bits and pieces they would like make off with them so my cats probably stole like two or three pieces from my last film set and so I would have to be I'd have to plan accordingly. So now that I have a house, I have a whole basement that I can just kind of spread out in. And that has been a really nice change. Um, so that especially for a lot of the tactile pieces or any like 3D printing or anything that's being painted, that makes things so much easier uh, where I don't have to worry about um, having to have the limited space. So that's been very, very nice. And then um, and then my other one is my office. My computer is at this point, like an extension of my body. Like I just, that is such a big part of my everyday life. And it's a, it's a big part of everybody else's, but that's the thing that I always have with me. That and my embroidery. Um, I'm always carrying around a bag with uh, all of my embroidery floss and things like that. So that if I have a spare five minutes, I'm like working on it a little bit. Um, but at this point, I feel like I probably spend a minimum of 10 hours in front of a, a computer a day working on um, animated pieces. So that would have to be like my medium and um, object that is just consistently a part of my life. And for me, um, it, it really depends um, what medium I'm working in at the moment or combination thereof. I paint primarily with um, acrylic gouache which doesn't use solvents. Um, that's a, a good reason why I do it. That's not the only reason. Mostly why I love that medium is because it gives you this beautiful velvety, non-glossy finish. So it, it, it really has a velvet quality. There's no sheen to it. And so I paint and draw at home. Um, when I make prints, I have to go to the, to, to the studio when there aren't students to work because 
I use, there's chemicals involved and the press is bolted to the floor. So that's not something that I can do at home. I have actually two small presses at home, but I can only use them for techniques that don't require heavy solvents. And when I'm making my own paper, I go to Frontline Arts to use their Hollander beater to beat the fiber. And then I can bring it home and make the paper outside. Um, or I can make the paper inside as long as I'm working very small because there's a water issue. So I spend a lot of time sort of, you know, choreographing what's going to happen where um, before I have all the elements to put them together when I'm working in, a, in sort of a, a cross-disciplinary way. Um, so the question I saw in the Q and A is, what's your main muse or inspiration for your art? So mine is most of my work is in some way autobiographical. So um, my last film, The Spirit Seam, was loosely based on mine and my grandfather's relationship, uh, and then this new film is based on. So it's a mixture of um, kind of an homage to my hometown. It's uh, about mine and my mother's relationship and how that has grown over time. And uh, especially, you know, as both of us continue to, to get older. Um, and then also another big inspiration for me is I, I always really liked small, intricate things. Um, a lot of like my old toys are a big inspiration for how I create things now. So like old doll houses, um, Polly Pocket, like the little Polly Pockets, um, pieces and, and different things like that just really influenced a lot of the ways that I create things now or look at uh, ways that I want to create artwork now. Uh, and then I'm also really inspired by um, these like old embroidery pieces like um, tapestries like the unicorn tapestries things like that. For me, I, I find that I can't really sort of create art in a vacuum or can't, I can't separate w what's going on in my house, outside of my house, and, and what I'm making creatively. Um, I've spent a lot of my adult life um, really uh, being an activist as well as an artist and using artwork as a way of of tackling images. I've I've worked extensively in and across South Africa. Um, I've worked with rural populations and urban populations and and worked um, using art as a as a as a means of trying to achieve positive social transformation. Um, I've worked on Native American reservations. I've worked with papermakers in Thailand. I, I I've been all over the place and I also am extremely sort of moved about what's happening here I, I you know the the homeless crisis and um, living under the poverty line and a, a whole bunch of things and they sort of just cascade into my mind and by putting all these sort of visual pieces together the work that I make a lot of times questions what's going on sometimes it maybe will suggest a solution sometimes it there, there may be a feeling of of hopefulness or a feeling of hopelessness in a way. So I kind of look at my work like jigsaw puzzles that kind of put together pieces of what I'm thinking about and what I'm hearing and putting them out there and hoping that it maybe sort of jogs other people to think about those things as well. I think I try to not be didactic and I try to have the pieces usually not be so recognizable that they look like public service announcements. So, you know, I, I, I'm trying to sort of give um, people things to think about the same way I am or to the way that they could think about them on their own by maybe just giving visual cues of things that I find compelling and hope that people can then take it and go in whatever direction they want to as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, with my work, I would say um, <clears throat> there isn't always a specific source of inspiration in so far as that the work has become so, um, again, generative uh, photographs that turn into sculptures and sculptures that turn into paintings. And uh, and just by observing the array of materials uh, in my studio from one project to another, it, there, there's 
there seems to be a kind of flow. It's a bit chaotic. I can't say that it's like very linear. Um, but there's a bit of a flow that happens between sort of the ideas that I have in my mind and what what I have available and what I might want to work with. You know, if there's an opportunity to work with a new material or a new process, whether it be industrial or or more traditional. Um, and it can come from things that I read, you know, reading about physics and astronomy, but I also tend to read a lot about geopolitics, even though my work is not, uh, let's say, overtly making any statement about political or social conditions. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I sort of tend to read a lot about this, uh, the influence that geography has on us and perhaps the tendency that... Um, uh, that we have towards survival, you know, like the idea of like an empire, it's like a thing that just wants to stay in place and survive and get bigger. And these aren't just ideas like concerning the geopolitics of our time. They've been explored by science fiction writers like Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, who in some ways have kind of predicted a lot of the, um, a lot of the tendency, a lot of the things that are in a way happening now, like, uh, you know, like even a character like Elon Musk is no surprise to me. Like there's a characters like that that were very sort of big ego pioneering, but really had a kind of money backing before they were self-made were already depicted in novels, science fiction novels of the fifties and sixties. And so with our capitalist society, there's always a tendency to go to the entrepreneur for like leadership. Um, so a lot of those things sort of play a kind of strange role in my head, but I'm always a little bit reluctant to describe them in any kind of literal fashion. So, so I tend towards abstraction or towards things that are very, uh, that could be in some ways related to like a hard sci-fi, like maybe takes a while to understand, you know, versus, um, versus responding more uh, viscerally to what's happening now. Uh, and there's also, there was somebody was asking, what are your influences in terms of artists? That's also a wave. Uh, but oddly enough, uh, as a male sculptor, uh, over time, um, whether by being excited or just simply by accepting, I've, a lot of uh, women artists that work in sculpture have become my influence, from Tara Donovan to Lee Bonacue to, to Sarah Z. Like, I was making work in my MFA, and a lot of my professors would say, well, you should go see Sarah Z's work, you know. And then I went and said, okay, how can I, how can I, you know, continue making the work that I'm making, but not be this work necessarily, but perhaps be in, in conversation with what's happening in, in her work. So, um, so that's sort of where I am with influences. Um, for me to answer that question, because I see that somebody asked about what artists influence us, and somebody else specifically asked me if I'm if I'm influenced by Frida Kahlo. Um, the interesting thing is, I love her work. I I adore it, and I always have. But I I feel like Frida Kahlo and I our our aesthetics are very different. Her work is so expressive, and you know the paint marks are alive, and they're. They're, you know, they're visceral and, and, you know, she, she's not afraid to, you know, throw paint at the canvas and have things drip and have things have a, have almost a rawness to them as where for me, the, the, the miniature articulation and the tiny little, um, you know, focus on realistic things that I put in a not so realistic way because I use them in ways to sort of, you know, create jigsaw puzzles of imagery makes them sort of very different than Frida Kahlo's. I would say that I'm more influenced by what's going on in society than I am by specific artists, but I think I've learned and been really inspired by, you know, the little Persian and Indian miniatures and the artists of the Renaissance who, you know, used egg tempera and gold leaf to make things more precious. And, you know, the, the, um, the, the Dutch artists who were really, really influenced by nature and started to really, you know, put all the little points on the pine cones and, and things like that. I think that's what really jazzed me up in terms of in terms of visuals. But then I just took those things and used them in a more contemporary way.
All right, well, we are just at about two o'clock. Um, so I want to thank all three artists who joined us today. Gianluca Bianchino, Eileen Foti, and Ashley Gerst. Um, let's give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> the, uh, the faculty exhibition is open through December 3rd in Port Gallery here in the Ben Sean Center for the Visual Arts on campus. Uh, we also have Sierra of Creation on view through December 3rd, and that is on view in the South and East galleries. Um, come and see us anytime, Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 5, and we will be open on a few weekends in the near future. Check out our website. Um, thank you all, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.